my name is Brad. I'm one of the teaching pastors here at 242. And, uh, and for me, uh, Memorial Day weekend, it's just always symbolized the beginning of summer. Uh, I mean, like, this is the weekend, you know, you get that three-day weekend, you get extra time with your family, extra time with your friends. You get that day that was just, it's unaccounted for, right? There's no lawn mowing to be done. There's no office that you, like, you get a day where you just get to chill, right? And, 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 and not just, like, the extra day of the weekend. For me, Memorial Day weekend, it's like, it's like a party day. Right? It's like we're going to grill out. We're going to have friends over. Uh, we're going to go on the boat if you have friends with the boat. I don't own a boat, so if you want to invite me, let me know. Um, so, uh, but, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like a go out, hang out day. And, and, and then my wife, my wife, it's the sales, right? This is Memorial Day sales. Going to get my whole summer wardrobe done. Going to get some new shorts, some pink shorts that are for me, not her. And then... Uh, um, but yeah, it's just, Memorial Day weekend, I don't know how you see it, how you celebrate it, but for by and large, for many of us, it's a holiday, it's a joyous day, uh, it's a fun day. But it's funny because that's not really what it's about. I mean, we, we, we know, I mean, if it, it's a federal holiday, and what it is, it's to remember, it's from, to memorialize the soldiers who died protecting our country. Like men and women who have names, who have families, who gave their life for something they believed in. And not to be much of a bummer, but I'm going to bum you out. Um, this week I was talking with a friend of mine who's, who's a widow. And she was telling me just how, man, Memorial Day is just, it's just so weird. I mean, her husband served, and, 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 and she's like, it's just, it's, for years, this was the day our family just partied. We had barbecues, went on the boat. Like, that's all it was. But for me, this, will, this day will never be the same. I'm always going to think about him. I'm always going to think about what he did. This is the day that it's not a day of fun, it's a day of healing. This is a day that I have to ex hold my son, and explain to him who his father was, what his father did. And I'm doing all that in the midst of <laughs> all my friends who, they're not being disrespectful, but they're just, it's just not the same for them as it is for me. And I was talking to her about that this week and I was like, man, I never thought about that before. Never really considered. And then, you know, we're in the middle of this series, you know, called Devoted. And, and I was just thinking about this series, you know. I mean, we're in this, you know, we're the third week of the series Devoted. It's the second year of a season that we're calling Devoted. And I think, I think how she feeling is feeling I think that's, that's kind of how we feel about this. You see, you know, some people, you know, 242, maybe you're new, maybe you're checking out, maybe you're here for the first time, and maybe someone told you, oh, you got to go to 242, it's, 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 it's the fun church. You got to go to 242, they got, you know, there's music, and, and, and there's a guy, and he has dreadlocks, and he'll tell a joke, it's hilarious, he's the best preacher they got. Um, <laughs> You know, for, for some of you, maybe that's, you know, that's kind of where you are. That's, I mean, and, and that's fine. That's totally fine. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're checking us out. I'm glad that you're, you know, you know have been coming back. And I, and I pray, please, continue to come back. But there's some of us here in this room. We're here because we've got to the point in our faith where we understand the sacrifice. We understand the, 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 the mission. We understand that Jesus gave his life so that, that, that we could be the church, and so that we can have the Holy Spirit, that we could go out and impact this world. And, and for us, when we come here on Sundays, I mean, yeah, we want to praise God and we want to be lifted up. But like for us, this is a reminder, reminder of the mission that we are devoted to and that we need to commit to. And sometimes when, you, when you're, you're sitting in here like, man, this, I mean, did, you look down a rose and the aisles, like, do they get it? Do they understand? Does that, do, do, this, do people understand what we're doing here? 
And that's what this series is. And, and, and so if you're here for the first time, I, I really encourage you to go back and, and catch up on this series because what we're doing, we're in the middle of, I mean, it is, it's a capital campaign. We're, we're, we're raising money because we feel like God is calling us to do something huge. And what I said the first week, that means if God's calling 242 to do something, that means God's calling each of us individually to do something. And so we've been on this journey for three weeks now and asking the question, are you ready to take your next step? Are you ready to take your step? Because if, if you don't take your step individually, we're not going to accomplish what God has for us collectively. And believe me, 242, we are the first in line for fun. But this series, this week, we have to focus on the mission that's to be done. And so we've been together every week and we've been kind of hitting scripture hard and we've been going through the life of Abraham and we've been asking tough questions. I hope you guys have been asking yourself these tough questions and I want to give you a, a two more of them today. But we're, we're going through the life of Abraham because here's the thing. It is, right, we're, we are raising money because, you know, we're, we feel like God's calling us to build you know, a youth center, that God's calling us to build a campus in Ann Arbor. Like we've, like, so those things need earthly provisions and so we are raising money for that but I told you week one and whether you believe me or not I'm saying it now this is not a financial series this is a faith series but for so many of us our finances is the very thing our faith is tied to the most and our finances and how we view them really determines whether or not we go all in and trust in God or not for many people not for all, but for many. And so that's what we're kind of talking about. And, and so we've been using the life of Abraham because Abraham, he is the patriarch of our faith. He is like, he is the, when you talk about this idea of faith in God, this is where it kind of begins. In, in, in Genesis chapter 12, God shows up to this man. He says, I'm going to bring about a way to conquer sin. I'm going to bring about a way to bless the world. He says to, to one man, to Abraham, I'm going to bless you and the world is going to be blessed through you. Will you follow me? And that first week, we talked about what a huge step that was to follow God. And then the second week, we, you, you see that this, this whole following God thing, it's not instant for anybody. One of the biggest misconceptions of the Bible is that years are, 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 are years of our life are in a single turn of a page. And so, so for many of us, you read the story of Abraham and, and God showing up and God promised him a son and God getting him a son. And you're like, why did the God do that so fast in his life? And I'm still waiting for my prayers to be answered. But then you have to realize nothing was fast for Abraham. That was 30 years. He waited 30 years from when God first said, I'm going to use you, to where God came through with his promise. And for 30 years, his faith was growing. Am I really going to trust that God is going to come through? Because today didn't feel like he was going to. And maybe some of that's where you are. Can I trust God? Today, if you have a Bible or a Bible app with you, uh, I want you to open it to Genesis chapter 13 uh, because I'll be honest with you, this is a chapter of the story of Abraham's life that I've read before and I've read right past. I'm just like, hmm, okay, that's, not, that's good information, moving on. And I knew that, you know, the series coming up, I've been, I've been you know, rereading the life of Abraham and, and I got to Genesis 13 and I read this passage and God just laid something on my heart. I'm just like, man, is that me? So I just want to read this to you, and, and, and we can jump, uh, use it for some jumping off points here. And um, this is set the scene for you, right? Abraham, he was in Egypt. God told him to go to this, this, this promised land, the land of Canaan. This is the land where I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bless the world because of you. And he gets to that land, and there's a famine, and it's a desert, and it's hard. And he's like, peace, I'm out. This is too difficult. I'm going to Egypt where there's food. I'm going to Egypt where there's people. I'm going to Egypt where there's security. God didn't tell him to go to Egypt. He just went. And we talked about last week how that got him into trouble and that got him in place. And so now Abraham is, you see the, the maturation of his faith. You see that he's coming back out of Egypt, back to where God told him to be. And look what it says. Pick up from the very first verse. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had. And Lot went with him. Lot's his nephew. He's traveling with him. Abraham had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and in gold. You know what I love about that? 
I think a lot of times when you think about oh, if someone's all in for God, if someone's all in with their faith, then they have to have a vow. They have to have a vow of poverty. Like if you love God and you own a sea dew, shame on you. <laughs> no, Abraham's rich. He's very wealthy. And then look what it says, verse three. So from the Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where he's, his tent had been earlier. He's just now getting back to where he was. You know, he's getting back to where his tent has been earlier. Um, and then it, it goes on, it says, and where his, he had first built an altar. And there the Lord called on, uh, then Abraham called on the name of the Lord. And this is what's interesting to me. Abram's just getting back to where he was. He's just getting back to where his faith is getting strong again. He gets to the spot where his altar was, where a place where he connected with God, and he stands there and he prays to God. And as you read on, you, you, you understand why he's praying. There's a problem. There's a problem that has to be solved. And so he's praying to God, God, what do you want me to do? God, what's the solution to the problem? How do you want me to handle this? In fact, verse five, here is the problem that, that he prays about. Verse 5 says, now Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land could not support them while they stayed together, for the possessions were too great, and they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abram's herders and Lot's, and the Canaanites and the Perizzites were also living in the land at the time. So Abraham said to Lot, Let's not have any quarrels between you and me or between your herders and mine, for we are close relatives. It's not the, the whole land before you. Let's part companies. If you go to the left, then I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, then I'll go to the left. And so look what Lot does, verse 10. So Lot looked around and he saw that the plain of the Jordan Toward Zor was well watered like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. And the two men parted company. Pretty straightforward. Abraham's traveling along. He gets back into the land where God wants him to be, gets back to the place where God wants him to be. It's interesting, the exact same problem rises up. It's not a full-on famine this time, but there's not enough provision. But this time, instead of tucking tail and running, he comes to God. He says, God, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to handle the situation with Lot? We both can't be here. God says, let Lot choose. Let Lot choose. And Abraham's faith starts to bud just a little bit. And he says, Lot, where do you want to go? And I'll just go the other way. And Lot looks at the land and, and he sees like, you know, basically a wasteland. He sees desert and then he sees lush, green, like the land of Egypt, a land that looks easy, comfortable. He says, I'll take that. And Abraham says, fine. And so here's my question. Do we make decisions like Abraham or like Lot? You see, Lot prioritized the riches that he could see. It doesn't say Lot prayed about it. it. doesn't say Lot asked God about it. it doesn't say Lot, you know, well, 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 I don't know, let's think about it. He just, he looked over and like, that looks nice. That looks comfortable. That looks easy. I'm going there. But Abram says, I'll go, God, wherever you send me, God, I'll go. And so God, Abraham gets the, the tough road of it. And, and, and what's interesting, and like I said, this is like a throwaway story almost. You read it like, oh, yeah, well, Lot went there. Abraham went there. What's the big deal? And you don't understand until you read the rest of the story. 
Lot wasn't, you know, being, you know, uh, mean. Lot wasn't being evil. He just chose the place that he thought was the best and the most comfortable. But what's interesting, as you read the rest of the story, when Lot gets into that place of comfort, he gets into these towns of comfort. He gets into these cities like Sodom and Gomorrah, these cities that are where everything is provided, your every desire is met, so that you, your, 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 your need to consume just grows more and more, that you want more financially, you want more intimately, you want more, uh, it just, just this, these cultures, these cities, grow to the point where they totally turn their back on God. They don't need God anymore. What's interesting is you read through the rest of the story, you see Lot, he gets to this point where he's convicted. He's like, this is not good. This is not good for my wife. This is not good for my family. He's like, this is, God is not in this place. And so he kind of has this moment where he like is awakened to this. And he's like, we got to leave. We got to get out of here. I got to get back to where God is. And he's trying to leave and it has already consumed his family. His family is destroyed. He's trying to get out of town. It says that his wife was like, she didn't want to leave. It says she, she, was, she would look back and it was to her demise. Lot lost everything because he made his decision based on just what was be most comfortable. And what's interesting is Abraham, you, you see how his life plays out. And it's not perfect. Like Abraham's life life's not, not perfect, but you see God with him every step of the way. I mean, Abraham prioritized the kingdom of God. God, where do you want me to go? I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what it, I, I, where do you want me to go that you will be with me? Because if you're with me, then I can do anything. It's interesting, you know, Abraham's in this, you know, his land and, and Lot's in, in, in his land. And Lot's is having a hard time. Even before it's all destroyed, like other kings are coming in. There's battles, there's war. At one point, Lot actually gets kidnapped. Like he gets taken back to another, you know, country. And, and word gets to Abraham. And Abraham's like, what? Lot was taken? Well, you tell those people that I have a particular set of skills. And the scripture tells us that Abraham goes and he frees Lot. And when he frees Lot, that he gets all the plunder from the kings that took Lot. And what's interesting is, even though Lot was in a land of comfort, Abraham comes out with more provision. And then here's another part of the story that's very interesting. If you have a, your Bible open, and you see the very next chapter, chapter 14, you might want to put your little, your little place marker there, dog ear that page. If you're taking notes on your foot, write it down. Genesis 14 is a very interesting chapter because Abraham gets this extra provision. He already had his needs met. He already had this money. He gets more money. And then what happens is he comes in contact with this king named Melchizedek. This is... One of only two times that Melchizedek shows up in Scripture. It's a very strange character. If you want to do a, like, a cool Bible study, just who is Melchizedek? Who's this guy? He shows up to Abraham. Abraham sees him and is convicted. He says, you are an amazing man of God. And it says that Abraham gave Melchizedek 10% of all he had. I mean, Abraham, in the, in the presence of Melchizedek, is just like, he prioritized being generous. He says, I could tell you are a man of God and you are moving God. He gives away all that he has. And, and so I'm like, who's Melchizedek? And, 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 and here's the thing. Scholars believe that he's one of two things, most likely. He's, I mean, the Bible tells us he's a high priest. So we know that's at least the minimum. He's a high priest. He's a man of God. He's, he is moving for God. Or... Some scholars believe he was Jesus himself. And that's weird, right? But here's why they believe that. The word Melchizedek, the name Melchizedek, it's a compound word in Hebrew. Melech, which means king. Sedek, which means righteousness. Literally, his name is king of righteousness. Genesis chapter 14, verse 18. If you're taking notes, write that down. It says that Melchizedek shows up the king of Salem. Do you know what's interesting? Nobody knows where Salem is. That town's not been mentioned before in Scripture. No one's talked about this town named Salem before. In fact, as you go forward in Scripture, they're not, there's another town called Shalem, which it may be close, but it's not Salem. In fact, the Salem, the word Salem, it means peace. So literally, you have the king of righteousness, who's the king of peace, show up in front of Abraham, the patriarch of our faith, and Genesis 14, 18 says that he shows up with bread and with wine. 
I don't know if that sounds familiar to some of you. And Abraham sees this man of God. And he says, you know what? God's providing for me, but it's not for me. It's for his kingdom. And so he gives him 10%. As you read through the Old Testament, you'll see that this is, this is the first example of what's called the tithe. And you'll see this play out through the Exodus. And you'll see this play out through all of the Old Testament. You'll see that Jesus talk about the tithe in Matthew 23, 23. If you're taking notes, you can write that down. But you'll see that this idea of trusting God with your finances, it has something to do with your faith. And so what I look at is these two different people. I look at Abraham and Lot. I look at two completely different just paths that they're on. And the question I ask is this, which one am I? Which one am I? When I'm making my decisions for the kingdom of God, what do I prioritize? Because it's not like Lot was evil. It's not like Lot was bad. It's just, it's just God wasn't first. For Lot, it was comfort. And I think about that for you and me. I think for so many of us, if we're being honest, I think that's how we prioritize our lives. When you make major decisions for your life, what what are the questions you ask? When you choose where you work, when you choose where you live, when you choose how, you know, whatever it is, you know, uh, know, how you want to parent your child, when you choose, you know, uh, where you want to go on vacation, when you make major decisions for your life, what is the question that you ask? Do we ask Abraham's question, God, what would you have me do? Or do we ask Lot's question, what seems best? And I've seen it, guys. I've seen so many people who just, and, and, and that, they're not evil. They're not evil. They just want to be comfortable. They want to be provided for. So they just do what seems best. But what seems best is the very thing that's destroying them. What seems best is to live in in this size of a house. So now I have to work at a job that is literally killing my soul. I got to work at a job that gives me no life. And now my spouse has to work at this job as well to pay for the house. And now our kids don't see their family, their parents anymore. And now we're just going through this because we're going after what we saw was best. Or how about this one? Think about how you parent. I'm telling you, this is not a financial series. This is a life series. This is a faith series. Think about how you parent. I have young children. What is the question that you ask yourself when it comes to parenting? Do we ask God, what do you want me to do with this child? Or do we say, what do I think is best for this child? And it's not evil, right? We just want this child to be provided for. We want this child to have a good life, to be comfortable. To be, and so we say, you know, so we, we, say, you know, we want you to get a good education. We want to pay attention to school so you can get to college. So you can get a job. So you can be comfortable. So many parents, the the base of our decisions is to get our kids in college. What if rather than focusing on merely college, we focused more on getting our kids engaged with Christ? Could you imagine the difference? And understand, I'm not saying college is evil. It's not, college is great. I'm not saying you're wrong for doing it. I'm just saying you're not doing enough. I mean, think about it. When you say, you know, I want you to get the good grades. I want you to go to school. I want you to be in this club. I want you to go to, to get these community service hours. I want you to be on this team so you can get, this, get, get to this college, so you get to this lifestyle. And then what? Could you imagine the difference? It's along with that, you're saying, you know what? The thing I want most, God, what do you want me to have for this child? I want my child to be a man or woman of God. I want my child to walk with the Lord. I want my child to be a light in a world that is dark. I want my child to know scripture and to know truth. I want my child that wherever they go, the spirit of God is so present on them that wherever they, sh- they show up, that people's lives are changed. That they don't, they don't change my child. My child changes them because God, the Holy Spirit is in my child and my child is a warrior for God in this world. So then when my kid goes to college, they're not going to stray because they know who God is. I mean, could you imagine? Like, that's the intentionality that we're trying to get to. It's, it's, it's about what do you prioritize? So for me, it comes down to, for me, it comes down to, like, us as individuals checking our hearts. If I want to know, if I'm being honest, am I Lot or am I Abraham? Do I make decisions on what I think is best or really am I asking God, what do you want me to do? For me, I have to just do little check-ins with my heart. And I don't know when's the last time that you have really just said, God, 
Are we good? Is my faith strong? I think about the check engine light (laughs) to my car, which is always on. (laughs) I'm not a car guy. I've told you this before, you know. I drive an old car. I don't care. That's how I roll. Um, But I remember when I had a new car. When I had a new car, oh, man, you, you love that car. When you have a new car, you, you actually wash it. When you have a new car and you're driving around and you drop a french fry, you actually look for it. <laughs> and do you remember, do you remember that time when you had a new car, new to you, whatever it was? Do you remember that time, the first time you were driving your new car and that check engine light came on? You're like, oh, no. You pull over, baby, what's wrong? You know, like... <laughs> you gotta live you know like like, like it was it was like no like, it was like heartbreaking you want to find out what was wrong you want to get it checked out you want to get it back to being new you want to get it back to being strong like that's just kind of how we were all kind of wired right but then you get to where I'm at old car checking the lights on I don't care I don't get concerned until it turns off I'm like oh no maybe the fuse is out I don't know But I think about that in regards to our faith. Do you remember when your faith was new? Do you remember when you first gave your life to Jesus? You wanted him to have your complete heart. You wanted to grow in your faith. You wanted to be in scripture. You wanted to know more about who God was doing. You would have done anything. God, I wanna change the world, just point me in the direction. And when there was something in your life, like the check engine light of your heart came on, you're like, let's address that now, God. I'm having this relationship, and I know it's not honoring to you. I need to change that. I'm doing this with my finances. I know it's not honoring you. I need to change it. You, when you first fell in love with God, you were ready for anything that showed up in your life to help to align your life to back to God. But some of us, we're a season where our, we've been walking with God for a long time. A long time. And the light's been on for years. But we're getting by. There's grace. Whatever. Yeah, you're getting by. But what if you're not living to the fullest? What if you're getting by, but you're not being the blessing that God wants you to be in this world? What if your salvation may be secure? God wants to do more through you. He wants to change the lives of other people around you. He wants to change the life of Southeast Michigan. And he's saying, if you're going to be a part of this church, of this congregation, then I want you to move. Are you going to take that step? So there's two questions I want you to ask this week as you're trying to check the, your heart. And the first one is this. What's first? What's first in my decision making? When you make a decision, what, what, what comes first? What do you prioritize first? Your comfort, your desire, or the kingdom of God? And you have to be honest with yourself. It's interesting, Jesus talks about this very thing. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, he says this, But seek first the kingdom, his kingdom, and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. You know what these things are? A home, food, clothes, Jesus is saying, God has you. Put his kingdom first and see if he doesn't show up and use you. You see, the problem is, many of us, we live our lives like we're like a, if you imagine like a vase that's filled with sand, filled to the very top with sand. And God's like this box of ping pong balls. If I poured them on that vase, none of them are getting in. They're all going off the top because there's no room. But what's interesting is if you just change your priority, If I have a vase full of ping pong balls, I put God first, and I pour sand on top of it, there's room for both. I get it. Some of you are like, you feel like, some of you feel, I can't, you know, you're going to ask, you know, make a commitment. You're going to ask me to, you know, what am I going to give in generosity and the buckets pass? I, I don't have margin to give. I don't have money to give. I cannot trust, I don't have any money. The problem is not the amount of money you have. The problem is what you do with your money. And like I said, it's not that you have a sea do or whatever if you have that, and it's not that you don't have it. The problem is that you just don't prioritize God. 
It's interesting how Solomon puts this in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Solomon says, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. When, when we fill our life up with money, then there's always going to be something missing. But when we seek first the kingdom of heaven, then we know, that, you see, that God, when he talks about having life and life to the full, we start to experience that. I know it doesn't make sense. That's where faith comes in. But God says sometimes the reason maybe you feel like you don't have enough is because you spend it all. Trust me and see if I don't provide enough. And then the other question I was having to ask is this. Does God get my best? Some of you, you know, you're hearing this message, you're thinking about this thing, you're looking at that card, you're like, you know, I can't. Abraham gave 10%. I can't. There's no way I could give away 10% and still live, still eat. There's no way I could do that. Okay. What's your best? And are you giving that to God? Like I said, not just financially, in your life, how you work, how you love your family, your spouse, how you minister to the people in your neighborhood, how you move as the hands and feet of God in this world. Is God getting your best? And if not, why are you holding back from him? Is it lack of faith? Is it doubt? Because here's what I know, and this is what this whole series is about. We believe God's calling us to do something huge. But that only happens if each and every one of us take a huge step trusting him. And here's why I want to do this, and this is why we feel like God's calling us to do this, because when we do this, we point this world to Jesus. And we do our part in his legacy. Long after we're gone, someone else will be pastoring this church. Someone else will be sitting in your seats. Someone else will be coming to Christ for the very first time. And the reason that they are going to have that opportunity may be because of this moment that we have here, this decision that we're making now. That's what it was for Abraham. What Abraham did, his faith and his faithfulness is the reason we're here today. And our faithfulness is going to lead the way for generations to come tomorrow. I don't know if you understand the magnitude of that. This past week, I heard an amazing story um, for what God is doing in the area of someone's life. And I just want to share it with you. So let's check out Melissa's story. My name's Melissa. I've been going to 242 for almost three years. I grew up in a Christian home. I was really involved in a youth group that was kind of um, instrumental in my life. I had um, developed a passion for serving and going overseas. Um, but when I moved to Chicago for college, my parents got divorced. Um, I went through a pretty challenging season and that was when I really wrestled with God and trying to understand who he was, even in the middle of hard stuff, and really kind of develop my faith as my own. Uh, about six months after I moved back to Ann Arbor, my dad was diagnosed with lung cancer, um, which was pretty shocking. I had felt like I was just kind, kind of settling back to being in Ann Arbor. And so about a week before my dad died, I stepped over at his house really quickly to pick something up, and we were just kind of chatting. And even though he had cancer, at this point we weren't we thought we had more time and more options. He was going in for a biopsy. And I don't know if he knew that his time was coming or had some kind of sense, but he said to me, you know, I don't have a lot of money to leave behind, but I have you and Elias, that's my son, and that's a pretty great legacy. And I was kind of like, oh, okay, whatever. You know, I didn't think much of it until everything happened a week later. So we started the Devoted series about six months to eight months after my dad passed away. And I, like everybody else, was thinking through what God was calling me to for the next couple of years, financially, emotionally, spiritually. And I had a number in mind, and we had the worship night at the new Ann Arbor building last May. And I felt like God was calling me to double that number, and not in an audible voice, you know, just an impression on my heart. Um, and part of that money would be from money I had gotten from my dad. So um, it's just been really cool to see the healing and hope that Devoted has given me. Um, I never thought it would help me with my grief process. 
but being able to contribute that and know that part of my dad's legacy is our new building, I think he'd be proud. This next week is a week that you need to understand thousands of people who call 242 Community Church their home are going to take very seriously. This next week, I want all of us to be wrestling with, am I Abraham or am I Lot? God, am I trusting you? And then God, what do you want me to do? And when you come back next weekend, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to just commit to God. Say, God, this is where I want to be faithful to you. This is what I feel like you're calling me to. Like I said, many of you are new. You weren't here a year ago, but a year ago, you know, we, we made this, this same decision, the same pledge. We said, you know what, God, we believe you. We believe what you're calling us to do. And here's my, here's my devotion part to it. I'm all in. And so we're going we're gonna to offer that again. And so here's what I want you to do this week as you're home with your family, with your friend, with your loved one, is I want you just to pray over this card. And next week you can bring it back, fill it out, and, and we're going we're gonna to turn them in and and there's two main things, right? Like one is like, maybe this is your first time you've seen this card and the first time you've done anything like this before. What do you feel like God's calling you to do? And the second thing is if, if you were here last year, you know, you're like, hey, for the two years, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm gonna, I just I feel like God's calling me to do. Then this is just an opportunity for you just to assess where you are. And maybe the number you put on this card is just the second half. Like, yep, I'm, I'm, I'm on track and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish strong with what God's calling me to do. For some of you, maybe you're like, man, life got hard. And I, 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 the best I could do is less than I thought. That's fine. Just be honest with God. And for some of you, maybe, you know, if I'm being honest, when I started this year ago, I, didn't fully, I wasn't fully all in. And I, I wanted to do a little bit, but I, didn't, I did not know this amount of life change could happen, this amount, of, I, now I see it, and now I know it, and now I want to do more. Whatever you want to put on this card, it's, we want to invite you to do that. And here's the thing, if you're here for the first time, if you're here and you're skeptical, if you're here and you're like, I don't know, I, I challenge you, come back. I challenge you to put something, put a $5, whatever it is, put something on the card, and this is why. Because when God starts to move, in the next two and three years, when you start to see the baptisms that are going to happen, you see the life change in Livingston County, Washtenaw County, Okemos, Meridian, when you start to see what God is doing with new campuses in Haiti, new churches in Poland, I want you to know that you are a part of this church. And even if you gave a little bit, if that's your best, that God used your best to accomplish his kingdom. And that God will get the fame and the glory for it. So wherever you are, Next week, we invite you to come back as we're going to turn these in and to celebrate what we know God is calling us to do in our individual next steps.